All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Canals Brown Bag Series. I'm excited to introduce Zach Canizzo, who is a Marine Protected Area Climate Specialist and Interagency Coordinator at the National Marine Protected Area Center in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Zach recently earned his PhD in Marine Science at the University of South Carolina. He is interested in climate change ecology, and his graduate work focused on the climate-mediated range expansion of the mangrove tree crab into salt marsh ecosystems. As a Canals Fellow in the Marine Protected Area Center, he has continued his work on climate change by reviewing and reporting on the impacts of climate change on marine protected areas and our national marine sanctuaries. And prior to his graduate work, Zach received his Bachelor's of Science in Biology and Biological Aspects of Conservation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today, he will be presenting A Home Away From Home, The Beneficial Role of Artificial Structures for Climate Displaced Species. Thanks, Alice. And thank everyone for coming and everyone who's attending on the webinar. I appreciate your interest in this subject. So when you take a look at my title, the first question that you should be answering yourself is what's a climate displaced species? You probably haven't heard that term before because I made it up. Um, you're not going to find it anywhere in the literature. It's brand new. Yay. But it's a really good term to describe the systems that we're going to talk about today. And what those systems are is essentially rain shifts. Climate change is forcing or encouraging many species to shift or change their ranges away from or expand out or contract in all kinds of different ways from their geographic range that they've historically been found in. <clears throat> now, this is something that we expect to happen more and more. We're seeing it happen with a lot of species. And there's been a lot of study on this in invasive species, but there hasn't been a whole lot of study on how native species deal with this shift when they move into a new ecosystem. And that's really the subject that we're going to talk about today. Most of the time when a species shifts its range, it shifts it along with the ecosystem that it's associated with, because most species can't really survive out of the ecosystem that they evolved in. But sometimes you get these climate shift mismatches, where a species is able to shift at a different rate from the ecosystem that it's historically associated with. So for example, you may have a species that's always been found in mangroves, but now it's shifting faster than mangroves and it ends up colonizing salt marshes. So these new habitats are novel to the species. They've never experienced them before. They're not adapted to live in them. Thus, the interactions that they have in these ecosystems are very likely to be suboptimal. It's not a place that these species are used to living in. They're not adapted to dealing with these conditions. Now remember, this is different from an invasive species. This is a native species that's moving into a new area. Invasive species are often transported to the area by humans, and then introduced to an area that's similar enough to the ecosystem that they're used to, that they can thrive. These native species often do not thrive when they enter these new ecosystems. So the case study we're gonna cover mostly today is this little guy here, the mangrove tree crab, Aratus bisonia. So if you put your thumb and forefinger together, that's about how big their bodies are, not counting their legs. They are an arboreal crab, so if you know what that means, they climb on trees. This is a crab that lives in the trees and it hates water. So it's also a crab that hates water. So it's really weird in pretty much everything that it does. <laughs> the reason why it hates the water is because there's lots of predators in the water. It's little, it's crunchy, it's food for everything. So the fact that it doesn't like the water is going to be really important throughout this talk. So just keep that in mind. So what it does is it climbs structure. It climbs up into the trees itself or whatever other structure it can find when the tide rises. So it's historically a neotropical mangrove associated species, meaning that it's found throughout the tropics of the new world in mangroves. But recently it's climate rated, climate mediated northward expansion has outpaced that of mangroves. So you've probably heard how mangroves are moving north. So is this species, but it's moving faster. Because of that, it's colonized salt marshes in Northern Florida and Southern Georgia. So this is exactly the topic that we were talking about. We have a native species moving under its own power into a habitat that it's never been found in before. And just as predicted, the salt marsh is a suboptimal habitat for this crab. We see that in a lot of ways. The most obvious is these crabs are much smaller in the salt marsh than they are in the mangrove. 
They also have decreased reproduction potential. They simply don't produce as many offspring. There's increased predation risk in the marsh. So even though predation risk in the water is bad everywhere, it's really bad in the marsh. These crabs are really, really likely to get eaten if they enter the water in the marsh. And they lose some important behaviors such as site fidelity, which is a behavior that allows them to return to the same place every day and save time in trying to find food. So we have this system where we have a species moving into a region where it's never been in before. It's a suboptimal region. So this is what we would call, what I am calling, a climate displaced species. It's moved there, it's larval dispersed. These guys don't have any choice in the fact that they're there. They get pushed into the water as larvae and they end up there. So it has to deal with the conditions that it's in. What about that other part of my title, the artificial structures? How does that play into this? Well, there's this idea of artificial structures acting as analogous habitats. And an analogous habitat is a habitat that provides a refuge for a species that would not otherwise thrive in the surrounding ecosystem. This idea grew out of the urban ecology literature. Because if you think about a city, a city is not a natural habitat. There, I mean, if animals are only supposed to exist in the habitats that they evolved in, there shouldn't be any animals in cities. But we know that there are. So a good example of an artificial analogous habitat might be this pool in a backyard. This backyard is not a great habitat for these toads and frogs, but you put a pool in there, that's an artificial habitat that acts similar to a pond. So it might not be ideal, but now these guys can survive there. An example that's a little more relevant to DC is pigeons. So pigeons are cliff dwelling organisms in case you were unaware of that. There are no cliffs in DC, in case you were also unaware of that. But pigeons do pretty well here. And that's because we've built buildings that look a lot like cliffs. So again, it's a habitat that is similar to what the species is used to, provides things for that species that allow it to survive in a region where it would otherwise not be able to survive. All right, now let's push those two ideas together. How do analogous habitats fit in with range edge populations? So we have a lot of literature on how artificial habitats help invasive species move forward. But the problem is when we think about invasive species, we're all, we, we often focus on how those species impact the habitat that they are now in. We don't often think about how that habitat is impacting the species. As native species start moving into new habitats, that's gonna be really important. We care about these species. We wanna manage these species. So this idea of habitats at the range edge started to hit the literature in the mid 2000s. There was one paper in 2006 who briefly talked about it, one sentence. And then this paper in 2017, this was the first really good one that I've been able to find. If you know of any others, please let me know. I would love to hear about it. This little hummingbird here, the Anna's hummingbird is native to Alaska. And what's interesting is these researchers found that these artificial feeders allowed it to expand its winter range. So this is areas where it's found in the summer, so it's not moving into a wholly new area. But because this artificial habitat provides food for this species now in the winter, it can survive there. A slightly better example came out earlier this year in May. Artificial reefs facilitate tropical fish at their range edge. This is more along the ideas that we were talking about. These researchers found that artificial reefs that were built along the east coast of the United States were allowing tropical species to expand further north than they were otherwise likely to be able to. So we have a habitat that's purely human-made, that's similar to the habitat these species that are, are used to, and it's allowing them to survive in areas that they otherwise wouldn't be able to survive in. The problem is besides saying, hey, it's a habitat that looks kind of like this other habitat, what's the mechanism? If we really wanna use artificial habitats to manage these range shifting species, if we really wanna understand how range, shift, how range shifting species are affected by these artificial habitats, we need to know why they allow these species to survive in these areas. So we need to dig into the mechanisms. And that's really what I did with our case study. So the role of docks, I'm introducing a third habitat. So we already have mangroves and salt marsh, and now we have docks in the salt marsh. So you come up into this area of the salt marsh, there's no mangroves around. It's a you know low complexity habitat about this high, maybe this high with marsh grasses, no canopy. And all of a sudden you see this. That looks a heck of a lot more like a mangrove than the marsh does. 
So now we've fallen into this idea, hey, it's a habitat that looks more like the habitat it's used to. Maybe it acts as an analog. And there are crabs there. There's one. There's a mangrove tree crab. Are they an analog? Well, we have our first hint here. These crabs are big on the docks. So you can catch a crab on the dock, and it will be bigger than if you go 10 meters away into the salt marsh. You're not going to find crabs that large. So that's a good hint. Maybe these docks are acting as a mangrove analog. But we really need to dig into those mechanisms. So we, answered, we asked a number of questions related to this big question of do docks act as a mangrove analog? So is this artificial habitat allowing this climate displaced species to be able to better persist and expand into this novel ecosystem? Does behavior differ between habitats? It could, that's important. Behavior affects a lot of aspects of an organism's ecology and it can often be affected by the habitat. Do habitats differ in the provision of disturbance refuge? So essentially, if a hurricane comes by, is it better to be in a dock or in the salt marsh? Is there something about those habitats that provide more protection? The differences between habitats affect the ability of crabs to expand. This is that same question with the artificial reefs and the fish. If just because there's a dock there, is the crab likely to be further north? How does the thermal environment differ between habitats? Crabs are cold blooded. So the temperatures they experience are going to affect a lot of different things to do with their uh, life history, their fitness. If it's too cold, they might die. This is a tropical species, remember, it's expanding north. If it's too warm, they're likely not gonna have as enough energy left over to do things like grow and reproduce as much as uh, crabs and other habitats might be able to. The other side of that coin is, does habitat affect diet? So these crabs feed on mangrove leaves in the mangrove. That's 85% of their diet. There's no mangrove leaves in the salt marsh. So what are they eating? And does that differ between the dock and salt marsh habitat? And finally, the ultimate question, how do these factors and habitats affect reproductive fitness? So if we're going to say that these artificial habitats are helping these species in this new environment, we probably need to test whether or not they're actually increasing the fitness of those species. Not gonna talk about the first two questions today, we just don't have time. They're not as interesting as the other four. If you want to know, feel free to look up the papers or ask me afterwards. I am obviously always happy to talk about my research. All right, let's orient everyone to the study area. We have Florida, in case you've never seen it before. Uh, Georgia, in case you've never seen it before. And here is where our mangrove sites were around Fort Pierce, Florida. We had our dock and salt marsh sites up around St. Augustine. This little diamond here is really important. This is the 2013 extent of this species. This was the first paper to show that this species had moved into salt marshes. We also have the northernmost black and red mangroves. So yes, there are mangroves in this salt marsh area, but this line here delineates the extent of the mangrove dominated ecosystem. So north of that line, you are in salt marsh. There are patches of mangroves here and there, but there's not very many of them. So what did I do? Who wants to dig into methods? We're not gonna do that. That's boring. I looked at crabs, I caught crabs. There's some crabs. If you really wanna learn more about methods and statistics, ask me later. We're not gonna cover it now. We're gonna stick to the fun results. All right, do docs increase expansion rate? Here's that map again. I want you to pay attention to that red diamond and those two trees. They are not going to move. We're just gonna zoom in to the northern extent. So how do you know whether or not a habitat is allowing a species to expand further north? You do this really crazy, intense, scientific method of going out and looking for them. So I went out and looked in the autumn of 2016, and look at that. They are further north on docks than they are in the salt marsh. Great. But remember, this is a tropical species. Its northern extent is really probably going to be restricted by the winter temperatures. So I went back out in the spring after the winter had a chance to kill off some of these guys and they died back in the salt marsh. So it's an active range edge. There's going to be advances and retreats, but interestingly, they didn't die back at all on the docks. So something on the docks is allowing these species to persist in the salt marsh when they're otherwise not able to. In fact, 36 kilometers further north than they're able to in the salt marsh itself. All right, one year is interesting. Let's try again just to make sure. Went out again the autumn of 2017. Again, they've moved further north. Now we're seeing them at the same northern extent in docks and marsh. That's fine. 
Maybe these crabs from the docks released some larvae that got a little bit further north. We can't really identify where these crabs are coming from, but at the end of an ice hop summer, they're all the way up there. Anyone who was in the southeast during the winter of 2017 and 2018 will remember that it was unusually cold. In fact, in this area, it was one of the coldest winters in 30 years. So what happens to a tropical species when it gets really cold? They die. They die back a lot. So we had a dieback of over 80 kilometers at the range edge in both the dock and the salt marsh. But interestingly, once again, these crabs are 22 kilometers further north on the dock than they are in the salt marsh. So even in extreme years, this artificial habitat is allowing this species to persist further north than it would otherwise be able to. Great, stop here, right? This, this habitat's doing a great job. But again, we wanna dig into the mechanisms. So why is it doing this? I mean, it's probably keeping it warmer, right? I mean, it's keeping it warmer, cold is what's killing it back, and that's, that is what's happening. We stuck some thermal loggers underneath the dock and in the nearby salt marsh, and it is consistently warmer underneath docks than it is in the salt marsh. You can see that in the real data too. I mean, it might be a little bit difficult to see for you guys out in the audience, but even on these coldest days, it's about six degrees at points warmer underneath the dock than in the nearby salt marsh. But this was an unusually cold winter. It consistently got below zero degrees Celsius. The lethal temperature for this crab is four. So it's getting cold even underneath the docks, and yet these crabs persisted in these docks. So what's going on? You'll notice this squiggly little black line here never reaches four degrees Celsius. This is the water temperature. So these crabs hate water, but if it's starting to get cold, it's probably better to be in the water where it's likely to be warmer because warmer water cools down a heck of a lot faster than air does than to just die if it gets cold. So we notice that when it starts to get cold, these crabs do stay closer to the water. They move further, uh, <clears throat> further shoreward. And what's likely happening here, the difference between these two habitats, is that at low tide, the marsh is no longer submerged. They like to hang out around these marsh grasses so that they can climb out of the water at high tide. But at low tide, they don't have access to the water in the marsh. So if you don't have access to the water, you're out of luck, you're dead. These docks, however, because they're built for people to be able to gain access to the water whenever they want, part of the dock does remain submerged. So we believe that what's happening here is that the docks are allowing these crabs to maintain a warmer environment overall and then on the extreme cold days, maintain access to the warmer water, which might just be able to allow them to survive. It appears that's the case because these crabs did survive this in the dock, but not in the salt marsh. All right, docks provide a warmer thermal refuge, which increases the speed and extent of expansion of the salt marsh. Great, this artificial habitat is providing something that allows these, this climate displaced species to survive in an area it wouldn't otherwise be able to survive. What about during the summer? Crabs in the salt marsh experience an environment that's too warm? It's a tropical species. That's a stupid question, right? But it's not. These crabs evolved in a forest. If you've been in a forest, you know it's shady. It's probably a little bit cooler. This is about all the shade these crabs get in the salt marsh when they're up on the grass. That's not much. That, that's not helping you very much. So we asked the question, during this time when crabs are forced out of the water, so at high tide, it's about six hours a day at best, are they experiencing a, warm, a warmer environment in the salt marsh? The reason why that could be bad is because for a cold-blooded animal like a crab, if you experience temperatures that are too warm, it's going to increase your metabolism, more energy is gonna to go towards that, you're not gonna have as much energy for things like growth and reproduction, these important things that help keep you alive and help your species persist. So how do we do this? Well, we paint some crabs uh, with nail polish, we release them and we watch them to see how much time are they spending in the sun and the shade. Hey, look at that. If there's no shade, you spend a heck of a lot more time in the sun. Crazy, right? Docks are shaded though. They have that nice little thing that we like to walk on. So it acts like a mangrove. It provides a shaded habitat for these crabs. Awesome. Docks are acting as an analog to the mangrove. They provide a shading habitat. And this is probably the craziest graph I will show you today. Uh, it's, it's cooler in the shade than it is in the sun. That's all that shows, but just proving it, it's significantly cooler. We're talking 10 degrees. Okay, so they're spending more time in the sun. Are they really any cooler or any warmer in the salt marsh? 
So what about that body temperature? Well, we took some thermal photos and found out. And yes, the body temperature of crabs is cooler in the docks than it is in the salt marsh. Hooray, we figured out that the docks provide a thermal refuge both in the winter and in the summer. So because these docks are providing a cooler habitat that's thus more similar to the mangrove than the salt marsh, it may be allowing these crabs to save energy that otherwise would be put towards metabolism if they were elsewhere in the salt marsh. Oh, sorry. What about energy intake? The other side of that energetics coin. Maybe if you're, you know, if a crab is pushing away more energy to metabolism, it can make up for that by eating more. Yeah, that's possible. So we took a look at diet. Remember, these crabs like to eat leaves in the mangrove, but they will eat animal material when they have the opportunity to. It's just a heck of a lot harder to catch a fiddler crab that's scurrying around than it is to go up to a tree and eat a leaf. But that animal material is actually a higher quality diet. It's easy to digest. It's high in calories. It's got all kinds of good fats and proteins in it. So they don't have access to these leaves in the salt marsh habitat or in the <clears throat> dock habitat. So maybe they're going to have to eat more. Maybe they can eat animals, but you still have the problem of trying to catch them. What's going on? First question is how much do they eat? Remember we said if you're expending more energy, maybe you can make up for that by eating more. So this is the one time I'm going to dig into methods a little bit because the way we looked at this was a little funky. So remember, these crabs don't like the water. So as the tide rises, they climb up onto the structure. They also have a gut passage time of about three hours. It's convenient because the tidal cycle from the time where the sediment becomes inundated to the time where it's no longer inundated is about six hours. It means the time that the tide is rising is about three hours. See, three hours, perfect. So what we did is we collected groups of crabs and we dissected them. First group we collected as the tide was rising right before they lost access to the sediment. So when you take the stomachs out of those crabs and look at how full they are, this tells us how much that crab is eating when it has access to as much habitat for food as it can possibly have access to. It can eat things on sediment, it can climb up into trees and eat leaves, it can go wherever it wants. We then collected crabs right at high tide. So what we're getting here is the idea of how much these crabs are eating as the tide is slowly rising. They're climbing up on structures, so they only have access to whatever food is provided by the structure. There's nothing on the sediment. There's no wet areas in the mangrove. I mean, they're just probably just climbing up into the trees and eating, right? That's fine. What are they doing in the salt and dock? And then finally, we collected a group of crabs three hours later, just before they lost access to the tide. So this is as the tide is falling. Crabs have access to the same dry food that they did the previous three hours, but they also have access to anything that the water is depositing on that structure. And what we see here is kind of an interesting pattern. First thing I want you to take notice of is crabs in the dock and mangrove, they have consistent gut fullness throughout the time. I should probably orient you to this, and I apologize that I didn't do this earlier. The letters correspond to significantly similar groups. So if you have an A and a B, that means they're significantly different. An A and an A means they're the same. So the gut fullness is the same in both of these habitats throughout the tidal cycle. Awesome. That means crabs in the dock and mangrove are able to probably eat as much as they want throughout the tidal cycle. They have constant access to food. That's not the case in the salt marsh. During this three hours where the tide is rising and crabs only have access to dry habitat, they're not eating as much. So they likely don't have equal access to food. Now they seem to possibly be making up for that by eating more overall. That's great. So we have some differences between these habitats. More consistent access to the food on docks, which is more similar to the mangroves, which is a benefit. What about diet quality? So it's all fine and good if you're eating more, but if you're eating things that don't give you very much energy, it's not helpful. So we took advantage of these stomachs that we already had and we examined this morphological ratio called carapace width gut width ratio. Yay, nice and scientific. All that means is the size of the crab divided by the size of the stomach. So a progressively smaller stomach would give you a higher ratio. And the interesting thing about this ratio is it allows you to get an idea of the long-term diet quality of crabs. A low ratio means a poor diet quality. They're likely high in <clears throat> plant material. A high ratio generally means a high quality diet, high in animal material. So there's a difference between eating celery. I mean, yeah, we call it good for us, but it's low calorie, difficult to digest. You're not getting a lot out of that. Or a hamburger, which is high calorie, easy to digest. 
But crabs don't eat celery and hamburgers. They eat marsh grass or delicious, juicy isopops, or you might know them as roly-poly bunks. When we take a look at this relationship in crabs, that's interesting. Okay, so crabs in the salt marsh have the lowest quality diet, fine. But crabs on the dock have a higher quality diet than crabs in the mangrove? <clears throat> What's going on? These things evolved in the mangrove. Why don't they have a higher quality diet there? Well, there's no mangrove leaves on docks. What there is on docks is following communities. There are a lot of sponges, barnacles, bryozoans, isopods crawling all over these docks. That's easy access to animal material that these crabs can easily catch. So what we think is going on here, what this tells us, is that crabs on docks are probably switching from feeding primarily on plants to feeding primarily on animals. You study this crab, that's weird. We never would have thought that was going to happen. Everything in the literature tells you these are primarily herbivorous crabs. They'll eat animal material when they can get it, but they're not going to target it. So are we sure about this kind of everything? Kind of. Um, I spent a lot of time watching these crabs, and they eat the animal material on the docks. Here's a picture in case you don't believe me. There's one of these crabs eating an isopod. They, they do it. But I keep drilling on getting into the mechanism. So are you going to believe me when I've shown you just this morphological relationship? I mean, we all know that morphological relationships can be iffy. So we looked at this again by examining the fatty acids that these crabs deposit into their eggs. Okay, so this has been shown over and over again in crustaceans to correspond really well to what they're eating. They tend to get a lot of these fatty acids from the things that they eat. And you can use particular fatty acids to get an idea of the diet of those organisms. So don't worry about what these trophic markers are exactly. Just know that this one, if you have a higher value of it, you have a lower trophic level. So crabs on docks have a very low trophic level. They're feeding more on animals than crabs in the salt marsh are. The mangrove one is unusually low. We can talk about that later if you want to. But we're focused on docks and salt marsh here. But what then are crabs in the salt marsh eating? If they have a low quality diet, they're not eating animal material, well, they're probably eating detritus. That's what this measure tells us. So detritus is bad stuff. They're eating rotting spartina grass, they're eating mud, and more specifically, the bacteria and the fungus that grows on these things. This is a low quality diet for these crabs. They are not evolved to primarily feed on this. So we have good evidence here that docks provide a superior diet to the salt marsh through increased carnivory. And crabs in the salt marsh have a low quality diet, high in detrit detritus. <clears throat> I wanna pause here with our case study really quick and just point out, this is why we need to study the mechanisms behind these artificial structures. This is an unexpected benefit of the docks. We never would have expected that they would shift to a <clears throat> diet high in carnivory. That's not what these crabs are known for. And we never would have known that and that that might be a benefit that they're providing if we hadn't dug into the mechanisms of how this artificial habitat benefits this species. So we really need to dig into the mechanisms of these systems if we're truly going to understand them. And why am I harping on this for diet? It's because diet affects a lot of things for a species. A high quality diet is likely to improve the reproductive potential of an organism, to improve its growth, to improve its energetics. You are what you eat. You eat a good diet, things are likely gonna go better for you. <clears throat> so docks provide a more favorable thermal environment, more constant access to higher quality diet. So we're getting at these mechanisms here. We're starting to show how this artificial habitat helps this climate display species. But how does this impact fitness? That's the ultimate question. If we can show that this artificial habitat is increasing the fitness of these animals, we've really shown something. So how do we look at fitness? Reproduction. Why reproduction? It's a measure of relative fitness. If you have two individuals of the same species and one has a better reproduction, it's more fit at a basic level. It's also impacted by environmental factors like spoiler diets and thermal conditions. So we know that these differ between habitats and we know they differ strongly between habitats. So maybe this is one of the things that can affect it. And importantly for this species and for many shifting species, it expands via larval dispersal. So increased reproductive potential, if you create more and higher quality larvae, that's likely to directly affect the expansion of this species, which is ultimately what we're looking at. 
<clears throat> so if you're familiar with looking at reproductive potential, especially for invertebrates, the first thing we often look at is how much energy is invested. Specifically, what's the proportional energetic investment? So how much energy are you investing per body size into reproduction? Often if we see a higher, what's called gonadosomatic index, it's the only time I'm gonna say that word, I promise. All that means is the proportional energetic investment into reproduction. If we see a higher value of that, we often say, hey, that individual has a higher reproductive potential. And a lot of times we stop there. So of course, what you're gonna expect is docs are gonna have a higher uh, investment, right? We've seen that for everything, but they don't. <clears throat> That's weird. Crabs in the salt marsh, where everything appears to be suboptimal, are investing a greater proportion of their energy into reproduction. So we could stop here and say, all right, everything we've looked at, it's wrong. We don't know what's going on. But while investing energy into reproduction is important, ultimately, you want to know what your return on that investment is. So we dug into that a little bit. What's the first thing you're going to look at? How many offspring are you producing? Well, that's different. Crabs in the dock and manga were producing a lot more eggs per crab than those in the salt marsh. Individual produces more eggs, probably more fit. <clears throat> what you should be asking me now is how is that return on investment? If you remember, our investment is proportional to body size. That's not proportional to body size. These crabs in the docks are much larger than they are in the salt marsh. A larger crab is going to produce more eggs. That's just how it works. So to get at this, to really get a return on investment, we had to look at the size corrected egg production. We did this by taking the residuals of the relationship between body size and clutch size. If you wanna know more about what that means, ask me later. It's a pretty simple uh, statistical technique, but I don't wanna waste time explaining it. And boom, two things here. First, the mangroves produce, crabs in the mangrove produce less eggs per body size than those in the dock and salt marsh. We'll get back to that in a little minute. Don't focus on that right now. I promise we can explain it. But crabs on the dock and salt marsh are producing the same number of eggs per body size. What's interesting about that is crabs in the salt marsh are investing more energy into egg production. So the dock is allowing these crabs to produce more eggs per energetic investment than those in the salt marsh. That's pretty good. Okay, but why is that happening? We got to look at the quality of that investment. To do that, we chemically analyze the eggs for energy content, glycogen content, total fat content, lipids, and the fatty acid profile. That's the <clears throat> fatty acids that make up those lipids. There's a whole lot of literature about how the different fatty acids, different ratios of fatty acids, different combinations of fatty acids can affect the ultimate quality of the larva. Not going to focus on those two today because they were the same between habitats, so let's keep it with the interesting ones. Total lipid content, there you go. <clears throat> Here's your answer to the mangroves. They invest a whole lot more lipids into their eggs. So they're producing fewer eggs, but they're investing more into those eggs that they produce. That's actually a common strategy we see in these range shifts. Populations at the range core have a strategy of quality over quantity, which is probably what we're seeing here. Well, is this at the range edge, i.e. the dock and salt marsh, remember these are at the edge of this guy's range, tend to have a strategy of quantity over quality. Just produce as many as you can, hope that some of them survive. This is a trait that's favorable for expanding your range. <clears throat> so that's probably our answer to why the mangroves are producing less eggs per body size. They're just producing higher quality eggs. But we see that the dock and the salt marsh, same quality investment. All right, so they're producing, crabs on the docks are producing more eggs per investment, but they have the same quality of investment. Stop there, right? No, if, if you haven't gotten the theme yet, we're gonna really try and get at the mechanism. So we looked at those fatty acid profiles. What's the quality of those lipids? The reason why we thought this might be different is because these are really, really closely related to the quality of the diet. We already know that crabs on docks have a higher quality diet than those in the salt marsh. So even though they're investing the same amount of lipids into their eggs, they might be investing higher quality lipids. <clears throat> Don't get sticker shock on this next slide. I don't need you to care about what each individual figure says. Just notice that for every single one of these, the dock bar is higher or the same size as that in the salt marsh. These are all different fatty acids 
that that are precursors to <clears throat> higher quality larvae. So over and over again, we're seeing these crabs in the dock are investing higher quality lipids into their eggs than those in the surrounding salt marsh. Great. What's the ultimate outcome of, of that? What's the offspring quality? If you don't know how to read one of these graphs, we'll do a really quick primer on it. The longer you last, the longer you survived, the higher quality the larvae. So crabs on the mangrove are producing the highest quality larvae. They survive the longest under starvation. The salt marsh, lowest quality larvae. Okay, there we go. Quality over quantity for the range core populations, quantity over quality for the range edge populations. But crabs in the dock are producing higher quality larvae than those crabs in the mangrove. I'm sorry, higher quality larvae than those crabs in the salt marsh, lower quality than the mangrove higher quality than in the salt marsh. <clears throat> awesome. That tells me docks provide an improved reproductive habitat. Those crabs on docks are more fit than those crabs in the salt marsh on an individual crab level. Same relative egg production for less energy, higher quality larvae for a higher quality investment. And interestingly, they may represent a theoretical mid-range reproductive habitat. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is that theory that in a range shift, populations at the range edge have this uh, strategy of quantity over quality, while those at the range core have quality over quantity. Crabs in the dock are at the range edge. They're exhibiting the quantity thing that we see in the salt marsh, but they're showing higher quality. So they seem to be almost like this mid-range strategy, but at the range edge. That's important, because <clears throat> that could increase the persistence and expansion in the salt marsh. If you have this climate displaced species, these individuals that have found this patch of habitat that allows it to be more fit, that increases the overall average fitness of the population in the region as a whole, all right? And over the long term, may help increase the, adapt increase the rate of adaptation to this new environment. <clears throat> To really get into that, we'd have to look at genetics. I didn't do that. Ask Sam Chu Chin if you want to go on that one. <laughs> All right, so I've talked to you a lot about this case study. I'm gonna wrap it up really quick before we get back into a larger discussion of those artificial habitats. In this study, we have this artificial habitat of docks that are providing an improved ecology and life history for this climate displaced crab by providing an improved thermal habitat improved diet and improved reproductive potential. <clears throat> so really quickly going back to those questions, do docs, provide, do docs act as a mangrove analog? Yes, but to an extent, they're not always perfect. And we don't expect analogous habitats to be perfect. If it was perfect, it would be the natural habitat of the species. It's better in some ways, the diet actually appears to be somewhat better, but it's worse in a lot of ways. If you noticed on that body chart, yeah, the thermal, uh, the body temperature chart, yeah, they were cooler than in the dock, they were warmer than in the mangrove. So it's better than the novel habitat, but not perfect. Differences between habitats affect the ability of crabs to expand. Yeah, we saw that. Does thermal environment differ between habitats? Yes, dogs provide a warmer temperature in the, <clears throat> in the winter, a cooler temperature in the summer. In the winter, they're probably just trapping heat under their canopy, which is what we see in forests as well, and you can't have that in a salt marsh. That's probably what's going on there. Does habitat affect diet? Yeah, low quality diet in the salt marsh, high in detritus, high quality diet in the dock, high in animal material. And do these factors affect reproductive fitness? Absolutely. Crabs on docks produced more higher quality larvae for a lower per egg energetic investment, likely due to a higher quality of investment tied to the higher quality of the diet of the mother. Okay. So what does my little case study mean to the bigger picture? The first thing is that we really need to spend more time studying the impacts of novel habitats on expanding and invading species. So there's a lot of work on how invasive species impact the habitat that they colonize, but there's far less work on how those species are impacted by the habitat. And this idea of habitat effects in general, it's important. So if we just looked at the salt marsh ecosystem, Docks are part of the salt marsh ecosystem. So if we pull everything together, we're gonna get a very different picture than if we're looking at the docks 
and the salt marsh as separate habitats. And for this species, they are. These things settle and they do not move much more than 50 meters in their lifetime. So a crab in the salt marsh, a half a kilometer away from a dock, is never gonna see a dock in its life. So these are very different habitats for this species. And it has very different effects on how this species persists. This is likely to continue to be true for other species that are expanding their ranges. So we really need to consider these habitat effects when we're studying these range shifts and these climate displaced native species. Further, the role of artificial habitats and range shifts is poorly understood, but I would say could be very important. I think I've shown that through the case study. It's probably pretty important to this crap. With the exception of my dissertation work, I have found three studies that have explicitly looked at how artificial habitats affect the range shift of a native species, three. And two of them have come out in the last two years. So this is starting to gain attention, but we need more focus on this. We know that artificial habitats do create good habitat. This is an oil rig. There's a whole lot of coral on them. Are these oil rigs helping this natural coral, helping this native coral expand? Possibly. There's some suggestion that there might be, but there hasn't really been a good dive into many of these questions. <clears throat> Finally, and a little bit more relevant to some of the work you guys might be doing, we need to start thinking of artificial habitats as a potential management tool. Often we think of artificial structures we think of them as being unnatural, as being bad, and it's best just to get rid of them, like this oil rig on the top, just completely remove it. It's no longer in use, get rid of it. More and more, there's this call to see how these artificial habitats may actually be improving habitat in the area. And for range shifting species, this could be particularly important. I've shown you that an artificial habitat has the ability to increase the fitness and persistence of a range shifting species in a novel habitat. Now it's much easier to remove, build, move in artificial habitat than it is to plant a whole bunch of mangroves in the salt marsh, say for some crazy reason you really wanted this crab to expand. So I'm not saying focus all of your management time on whether or not you're going to build or move an artificial habitat. I'm just saying when you're thinking about managing these species and the effects of climate change on them, especially if they're shifting their ranges. Just keep in the back of your mind that there might be an artificial habitat out there that is aiding or hindering that species. And maybe that's something to consider in a management approach. All right, I hope that I've been able to convince you that artificial habitats aren't all bad. And I hope that I've shown you something at least a little bit interesting and didn't get too bogged down in the science. And with that, I will show you a picture of a spider eating one of these crabs to get you an idea of how big they actually are and ask if you have any questions. Yeah, so the question is uh, when you, sorry, I got to go back to a figure here. Whoops, wrong way. The question is uh, when we're looking at, are we actually looking at the difference between, did we look at any differences between what we find on the growing on the docks and what we find growing on the mangroves? And if things are similarly growing on mangroves, why aren't the crabs eating those? Is that more or less what you're looking at? And the second question was, I apologize. Well, you also showed that the, the quality of the larvae was lower Mm -hmm. right? And yes. So why would that be lower? Is that just from a genetic point of view that they, that's the way they eat that stuff? Yes. And the other quest, part of that question was we showed that the quality of the larvae on the docks was lower than in the mangroves. So why would that be? Is it just due to a difference in genetics of how these crabs invest their energy? So the first question of uh, the difference between the following communities, I kind of briefly said I might come back to that here. That trophic level for crabs in the mangrove is a lot lower than we would expect it based off the literature. 
I only had a certain amount of time in my uh, dissertation, so I didn't dive into it, and I would have liked to. I suspect that they are actually eating far more animal material in the mangrove than we give them credit for. A lot of the studies that have looked at how much, how much they're eating as far as plant animal material have done visual inspections of gut content. That's great. The problem with that is soft material digests much faster. It's much more difficult to identify. And thus, it's mu you're much more likely to get a false negative on animal material because these crabs do not eat the hard parts of the animals that they kill. You'll notice in this picture, it's not eating the carapace. It has ripped the carapace open and it is only eating the soft parts. So I suspect if we started doing some more, uh, say, stable isotope analyses on these crabs, we would find they're eating far more animal material than we give them credit for. There's some evidence for that in the sister species in the Pacific where we see that they have a much higher, uh, they have a higher proportion of animal material in their diet than those on the Atlantic. And that's because someone did a stable isotope analysis on their diet. Um, so that's the answer to that question. I think we are actually seeing higher proportions in the um, mangrove. As far as the larval quality, <clears throat> I have two answers to that. The first is that these crabs in the dock are still on the range edge. So we do expect them to have a bit of that uh, strategy of producing more offspring. So they're going to invest overall less than any individual egg, which is gonna lower the overall quality. Additionally, these crabs did evolve to feed on mangrove leaves and they're not getting those mangrove leaves in the dock. So even though you have this high quality animal material, there, is likely, there are likely some fatty acids that they are evolved to have and evolved to use and invest into their larvae that they're not getting. In particular, this one here, ALA, alpha-linoleic acid. It's an important omega-3 fatty acid for larval development. And it's much higher in the mangroves. The reason for that is it's in really high quantity, in quality, quantity in mangrove leaves. So this is something that we would have to dive deeper into to really get a for sure answer on the mechanism in that. But I suspect that part of the reason on top of the greater investment in the quantity of offspring is that they're just not quite getting the exact type of diet that they would need to have the highest quality larvae possible. Is that? Yeah. Any other questions on that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Great, great talk. Uh, do you have any idea how connected, I know you didn't do any mm. genetics work, but I feel like the population size would have a big effect on the quality of offspring. It's mm -hmm. like diverse student crabs that are reproducing another. Yeah. So do you have any idea how connected your environments are or how large the population size is? Mm -hmm. So the question is, do we have an idea of how connected the environments are and if there's any differences in the population sizes? Diversity, diversity in the population. Genetic diversity in the populations. Um, a little bit of yes, yes to both of them with a uh, with a caveat. So there was a study done by the person who pre, who first found these crabs in the salt marsh, was in the same lab that I was in just before me. She did a genetic study. It's not published, but it is in her dissertation. So you can find the publish publication of her dissertation. It's uh, Megan Riley and her dissertation would have been 2015, I believe. Someone's gonna tell me I'm wrong on that, but that's okay. So Megan Riley, and she did a genetic study along the Florida coast up into Georgia using uh, <clears throat> COI1 markers to look at the genetic diversity. And what we found was that the populations along the Florida coast all the way up to Georgia were all more similar to each other than you even have between Southern Florida and the Florida Keys. So it appears that this is a very genetically connected population. The um, kind of somewhat eh, to that is that there have been some questions as to whether or not that is the correct marker to use in a range expanding population. Uh, so maybe there's slightly more genetic diversity and differentiation than we see. We're not really sure. They are probably pretty well connected because in general, in general, the uh, flow of the currents is, the flow of the currents with tidal flushing is generally northward. So what we think is happening is that we get a large flow of larvae northward into these environments. So there's probably constant reseeding from the mangrove, especially in these further south salt marsh environments. 
when you start getting into the very range edge, there might be a little bit more of a, um, there might be a little bit more of uh, input from those populations that are in the salt marsh and dock. As far as the genetic diversity of the populations, we simply don't know. Besides that one study, there hasn't been uh, much study on it, on this crab at all. This is a crab that's noted in the mangrove community for being important, but on the general scale, people don't care about this crab, which is one of the reasons why I was able to get permits to go out and, you know, collect a bunch of them. They're not they're not economically important. They're ecologically important in the mangrove, but not in the salt marsh. So it'd be great to find out. And that's actually something that I would like to do is do a microsatellite study at the range edge and see if we see some differences. Great, SNPs even better. Awesome, I'm not a geneticist at all. So SNPs, that's what I look at. Okay, we do have some um, online questions coming in. So I'll um, someone had wanted to know, um, regarding the larger crabs in docks versus in the salt marsh, could part of the reason the larger crabs are on the docks because they're able to defend the territory? Um, basically, uh, is it, uh, does defending territory play a role, or is that behavior not typical of those crabs? These crabs are not territorial. Okay. Um, they do, one of the papers that was in the behavior one is they do have ritualized aggression, uh, but that's just kind of establishing hierarchy. These things are incredibly dense on the trees and in the docks, not always so much in the salt marsh, which is interesting. So you can, and sometimes even in the salt marsh, when the tide goes high, you'll see five or six of these within three or four inches on a piece of grass. They, they don't really defend territory so much. Another question we had is, how might artificial habitats be changing otherwise natural communities nearby? For example, are docks facilitating crab expansion in salt marshes? And does that expansion displace other species or change community structure? Yes, and that is, see, that is the other side of this coin, where I'm sitting here just trying to advocate for the thing that people think of less, which is the potential benefits of artificial habitats. There are a lot of, of things that they do that aren't good to our natural communities. One of them is that they do tend to favor non-native species, especially invasive species. Um, and we do, we haven't looked at it yet, but we have some uh, very circumstantial evidence that docks may be, uh, that this crab may be displacing um, scoreback marsh crab, our Massey's uh, cinerarum, in the northern part of its range. They do this, these two crabs do coexist in the mangrove. They segregate spatially. But once you get north of where the mangrove tree crab is found, the scoreback marsh crab is found throughout the entire tidal range of the marsh. When you get into the area where you also see this. <clears throat> this uh, mangrove crab, you start to not see the Armasses, the squareback marsh crab so much in the low intertidal. So that may be happening. We haven't looked at it scientifically yet, but it's definitely a possibility. Okay. Um, great. And there's someone else that wanted to know, uh, might be the wrong way to ask, but does the diet change the time or egg density? Uh, it does not. So no, it does not. We did take a look at that. Uh, we also took a look at the timing of the reproduction and all of that. The, the reproduction stuff that I hit on is a, <laughs> what I touched on was a very small part of a much larger study that is currently in review, but it doesn't appear to affect the incubation time, uh, at least as far as we can tell. Uh, they don't have differences in the timing of when they reproduce, when they release their eggs, any of that. So. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, can you comment on how the range shifts a species, perhaps aided by artificial structures, may impact species originally native to an area that is now being expanded into? Yeah, and this kind of um, hits back on that previous question as well, where it is definitely possible that aiding this species expansion into this new area is going to displace a species that is already there. They might end up competing uh, as we as we possibly see with this mangrove crab and the squareback marsh crab. That is definitely something to consider. The thing that I just 
want to try and get across is that in these management considerations and when we're studying these things sometimes we do have to make the hard choice between one species or another no one's going to choose this crab no one cares about this crab i know that it was a good study system to show what's happening but if you do have to make a choice between say a threatened species that's that's shifting its range it might not be expanding it maybe it's contracting it uh no maybe it is expanding maybe it's moving its range say up a mountainside and if you install some artificial habitats it's going to allow it to persist better but it's going to have a negative effect on the species that are already there that might be one of those tough management strategy management decisions you have to make and unfortunately climate change is going to force us to have to make these decisions so in my opinion it's better to get out ahead of it and start studying the mechanisms behind what might be happening so we can make an informed decision when it does come to those decisions any other questions here okay i'm not seeing any questions online um so we can uh say goodbye to our online audience and thank you zach Thanks, everyone. If anyone has any further questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Always happy to talk about this. Thanks, guys. Off before I break.